to black, green smoke to black, green turn to black, yeah, that's what we stand for, green turn to black. Green Hello everybody, Russian Nihilist here. I know I haven't made a video in quite a while, and I do apologize, I have been busy, but today we, we have a treat for you. Uh, I am joining my good friend Ruben. Hi. He says hello. Uh, and we are going to be talking about what Epicurus would think about today's society if he were living currently. Um, most of you know Epicurus as the man who coined the problem of evil. Uh, for those of you that don't know, for a quick ref uh, refreshment, it goes, uh, is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Is he neither able nor willing? Then why call him God? That is a very short eight-line argument that refutes the moral argument for the existence of God. Most of you know him as that guy, which which is good. Um, he he lived during what was it? 300, 341 B.C. to 270 B.C. Um, he was he was an atomist, which is a very primitive form of what we know to be true today, that there were just atoms and void. Uh... In this session, we're going to be going over the principal doctrines of Epicurus, uh, going point by point, uh, maybe modernizing a few, or making it more relevant to modern society. All right, so Ruben. The Principal Doctrines of Epicurus A blessed and imperishable being neither has trouble itself, nor does it cause trouble for anyone else. Therefore, it does not experience feelings of anger or indebtedness, for such feelings signify weakness. So this is obviously a reference to God. Like, very obviously yes. a reference to God. Very. Um, it's pretty much saying exactly what it says. Uh, Epicurus was known for being very straightforward. He wasn't very flowery, like a lot of ancient philosophers. Um, he basically told people what was up, and... Yeah, didn't really need as much interpretation as, say, Plato or Aristotle. Um, he says here in the first one that uh, essentially a blessed and imperishable, be uh, imperishable being, which is what we would think of as God, uh, doesn't trouble itself and it doesn't trouble anyone else. So it never has to deal with anything. It doesn't get pissed off. It isn't vengeful, like the Bible will say that God is vengeful and merciful at the same time. Oh, yeah. Which is wonderful. <laughs> Beautiful. Um... It also specifically points out uh, that the being doesn't feel in debt, and that that is a weakness, and that 
seems like it would be a criticism of the Abrahamic God because of all the anger against humanity when humanity was sinning. You know, in, in, in the Bible, that's, that's why he flooded the earth. And also because he tends to make deals with the prophets in the Bible, which would put him in debt. I, I really like uh, this one because it explains why such a being can't exist. Because the definition for God, um, or some of the definitions, would be blessed and imperishable. But yet, when we look at a uh, an Abrahamic text, uh, you know, Bible or the Quran, we see that God does in fact feel anger. Uh, and being blessed and imperishable and feeling anger cannot coexist within one being. Yes, and it's true that Epicurus did write at some points that he did believe in the gods, um, whether or not that's just due to social pressure is open for speculation. But he did write that he thought that they were different than how people generally uh, believe them to be. Yeah, I, I think most of the reason that he was... I, I mean, he, he was a deist, I believe. But most of the reason he didn't not believe in God was because at the time there was just nothing better to believe in. There's no doubt in my mind that in today's society he would be an atheist. Yeah, you're probably right. Then we should move on to the second point. Would you like to read it? Sure. Death is nothing to us, because a body that has been dispersed into elements experiences no sensations, and the absence of sensation is nothing to us. I, the first time I heard this, I heard it uh, a very different way, but the same gist. The way I heard it was, if death is, I am not. If I am, death is not. Why should I fear something that cannot possibly exist when I do? Uh, before that quote, I always kind of feared death. I didn't like the idea of non-existence. But then I heard it, or I read it. But right after that, I realized that the fear was illogical, that there was nothing to be afraid of. Because I'm dead. What do I care? Yeah, that's true. And it should also be noted that this is very progressive of him to say, because he is essentially saying that either he doesn't believe in any sort of afterlife at all, or that he is absolutely unafraid of what might be. More likely that he doesn't believe in it at all. Um, it's also very congruent with what many non-believers today uh, say about death. Um, and it also made him stand out a lot uh, amongst other ancient philosophers. Uh, for example, Aristotle was very much afraid of death. Um, but Epicurus writes it off as something not to be feared, not to be paid attention to. It's barely even worth speculating on. And that 
is very different. A lot of people still are obsessed with that. And that's very true, especially, uh, like, Ruben, you've met my mom. Yeah. She is very afraid of death. And I told her the quote, and she agreed that there was nothing to be afraid of, but yet somehow there's still that fear. And I could never really understand that. Even when a person knows something to be true, they choose not to believe it, which is silly, because knowledge is a subset of belief. I never quite understood that. Okay, hold on, Ruben. Uh, my mom's calling me. Uh, you can talk about the third point. I will be right back. All right. Epicurus's third point is pleasure reaches its maximum limit at the removal of all sources of pain. When such pleasure is present for as long as it lasts, there is no cause of physical nor mental pain present, nor of both together. So Epicurus is saying here that pleasure can not only be defined, but the limits of pleasure can be defined. And that is at the removal of all pain. And pain may be mental or physical. It may be literal pain, agony, anxiety. Or it can be just longing. And with the removal of all that, you have nothing but left but pleasure. And this is very much a hedonistic quote. It's showing Epicurus's love for the natural world and his interpretation of how we should live our life. Um, he says that when this maximum pleasure is present, there is no more pain. Pleasure is defined as the lack of pain to the Epicurean philosopher and by Epicurus himself. It isn't something that can be really had alongside pain. And I believe he goes over it more later on in the text, but Epicurus himself uh, believe that even though there are different kinds of pleasure, a kind of maximum pleasure can be attained. And from there, it's just variations of it or different flavors. Like when you go into an ice cream shop and you ask for a scoop of ice cream and you want to get ice cream and there are just very many kinds of ice cream to choose from. And with Lawrence still being gone, I suppose that I'll move on to Epicurus's fourth point in his principal doctrines. Alone, sadly, where he says, continuous pain Continuous physical pain does not last long. Instead, extreme pain lasts only a very short time. And even less extreme pain does not last for many days at once. Even protracted diseases allow periods of physical comfort that exceed feelings of pain. And this is very straightforward. I think that by uh, the extreme pain, Epicurus is probably referring to the pain of dying. However, once death is reached, there is nothing more, and there is no more pain to be got. Um, with the disease bit, I suppose he could be referring to a kind of relaxation and relief where and this is a loose interpretation, but 
if I'm very ill and bedridden, obviously I can't go out and do work. I can't do heavy labor. I am forced to relax. And there is physical comfort in that. And sometimes that comfort does exceed the feeling of pain. And it's only by venturing outside of that comfort that the pain comes back. Um, hi, everyone. I'm back. Oh, hi, Lawrence. We're on number five. You should read it. Five? Sure. It is impossible to live pleasantly without living wisely and honorably and justly. And it is impossible to live wisely and honorably and justly without living pleasantly. Whenever any one of these is lacking, when, for instance, one is not able to live wisely, though he lives honorably and justly, it is impossible for him to live a pleasant life. I think that this is... This, this quote did, in fact, change my life, personally. I, I definitely attempt to live wisely, what I would call wisely. I go out of my way and learn everything I can about science. I go on, on uh, Science Daily. It gives about eight to ten new scientific discoveries every single day. Uh, one would call that just knowledge, not really uh, wisdom. But over the years, the more you learn, the, the more wise you become. Uh, I am only 19. Uh, but I am sure that soon I will be one amongst the group that people would call wise. Uh, in accordance to honorably, I try my best. I don't go out of my way to be honorable. Uh, I don't know if I'm living a pleasant life. My life is not that bad. I'm not complaining. I'm a very happy person. Uh, the Epicurean version of the good life is very simply having a job that you love no matter how much it pays. Uh, hanging out with friends, sitting around, and just discussing philosophy, expanding each other's minds. And I do that daily. And boy, is that wonderful. Yes, it is. And I think this is probably, if not the most important quote on the list, one of the most important quotes, because it does essentially contain all of Epicurean uh suggestion on how to live your life and what it says is live your life fully and if you're not living your life fully you're not doing a justice to yourself and uh, you can't possibly be experiencing uh, pleasure you can't be as happy as you can be if you're not living it fully and the Epicurean version of a full life is, like you said, just a wise life, an honorable life, and a just life. You keep a moral code, you don't go beyond it, you like to grow, you like to discuss, but you do have your idea of what is right and what is wrong, and you live your life in accordance to it, and that makes you happy. And in the process of creating your idea of those rights and wrongs, which 
does take your entire life, you gain wisdom. And it's only through wisdom that you can really make the decisions for yourself what is right and what is wrong. That is very true. Uh, more on the quote, the part about living a just life, that I think is the most important part. Because I think all actions must be justified. Because if they're not, then there is no reason calling any action a logical action. The reason I think logic is the best tool is because it leads you to the best answer, to the one that makes the most sense. And I am a person that follows the laws of logic. If logic dictates I do something, I do it. Sometimes it is difficult because I'm only human, but I always let logic lead my train of thought. Uh, and because of that, I have made much better decisions. I'm a much happier person. I don't really feel any stress anymore. His, his version of the good life is the best that I have read about. Um, there is definitely nothing that is not admirable about Epicurus's idea of the good life. Anyways, we should move on to the next quote. You should read it. I read the last two. Of course. The natural benefit of kingship and high office is, and only is, the degree to which they provide security from other men. This is a recurring theme that you're going to see throughout Epicurus' writings, is that he talks a lot about friendship, he talks a little bit about leadership, and he talks a lot about security. In order for us to live the life that we want to, we need to be secure. We can't worry about being robbed while walking down the street. We have to have some level of security so that we can live our life the way that we want to. And how do we do this? We have a government. They, you know, they put uh, rules in place that we have to follow or else we'll be punished. And though it doesn't always work out properly, uh, the purpose of this high office is to secure people so that they can live out their life. So Epicurus must very strongly stand against things like anarchism uh, or anarchy where there isn't such a security blanket in place. I think that, I mean, the, what you said was very true, that <clears throat> we always have to be secure. Otherwise, we'd just be all paranoid and freaking out, and it just would not be good. Um, but I think this, I mean, it says right here that the benefit is to the degree of which they provide the security. Uh, this, I feel, can also be interpreted in the way that respect, especially respect of authority, must be earned. They are not free. Uh, and I think not only respect for authority, but respect for anyone or anything must be earned. Yes, that's very true. Epicurus' next quote is, Some seek fame and status, thinking they could thereby protect themselves against other men. If their lives are really secure, then they have attained a natural good. If, 
however they're insecure, they still lack what they originally sought by natural instinct. So that's very straightforward. I think. Do you have anything to add on to that? Has that changed at all? I'm looking this over. Let's see. Some see famous dads. I'm just reading this to myself for a better cognition of it. Okay. Um, this reminds me of my own personal life. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to tell you about that, but it does remind me about it. Because I feel that a lot of the people in my life are, in fact, insecure. That they, they try to do things... To have people remember them, not and it doesn't even have to be in the good way. He says uh, that they seek fame and status, and that does not necessarily mean positive. Uh, this this also reflects not only any famous people, but it reflects the everyday bully. Because the everyday bully literally does attempt to quote-unquote protect themselves against others. But then it says that if they're insecure, they still lack what they originally sought. And from a from a very good analysis of bullies and why they bully, we know that no bully is secure. Of course. Anyways, the next quote is, No pleasure is a bad thing in itself. But some pleasures are only obtainable at the cost of excessive troubles. And I know that you stepped out of the room when we read uh, a few of the earlier things talking about uh, pleasure and pain. But essentially, Epicurus believes that pleasure is the lack of pain. And I think what this is saying is that not only uh, are these troubles going to be the opposite of pleasure, which is pain, but they're also going to uh, reflect your effect on other people. If the pleasures that you bring yourself are at a higher cost uh, than they're worth, if they cause more pain either to you or to someone else for you to obtain, then it becomes a bad thing, the process of doing so. The pleasure itself is just fine. Like, if I were to crave candy, and I had the pain of craving candy, I would take some candy and eat it, removing the pain and creating pleasure. However, if I were to do so by stealing it from a baby, I would be causing distress in that baby, which would not be worth it, it would become a bad thing, because the baby would be distressed, the baby would start crying, it would affect its parents, it would affect me, and it would be more trouble than it's worth. Yes, definitely. This, this is one of the things that I also live my life by. I, I know what makes me happy, but then I think... I know what would make me happy, but is it really worth the trouble? And I had a lot of thinking to do when I went to college. Is it really worth it? Especially at 
my place in life now. Uh, I'm still living with my parents. I'm not really in a threatened position to have to do anything. Uh, if I really need anything, I could just go to them. I have a, I have a job that I do enjoy. Uh, I'm not really in any threatened position, so going to uh, going to school would not be worth it right now, because right after high school, I did not want to be rewarded with more school. I would like to live a little. And I think that determining worth of a pleasure or worth of enough troubles to constitute a better pleasure uh, should be the way to analyze if you should do something. And this goes back to living a pleasant life, uh, living justly. Yeah. It's a, it's a good comparison to your life. But let's move on. Sure. You should read the next quote. Sure. If every pleasure could be prolonged to endure in both body and mind, pleasures would never differ from one another. All right. Um, I, I really like this because it not only separates body and mind, but it talks about existing in mind and or body. Uh, but categorically, nothing can exist in both, including a pleasure. I mean, if you think about it, I think that all pleasures are from the mind, obviously, because we would not be able, we would not have pleasures if it weren't for a mind. All pleasure is felt in the mind. Um, but I think this does a good job of separating body and mind. Yeah. Um, and it should be noted that Epicurus is different from other hedonists. Uh, people who practice the hedonistic philosophy, in that Epicurus did value mental pleasures above physical pleasures. Um, hedonists who came before and after Epicurus were sometimes scolded for the way that they lived their life, even though it was in accordance to their philosophy because it seemed crude and vulgar, whereas Epicurus really just wanted to relax and have a good time with like-minded people. Uh, the next quote is, If the things which debauched men find pleasurable put an end to all fears, such as concerns about the heavenly bodies, death and pain, and if they revealed how we ought to limit our desires, we would have no reason to reproach them, for they would be filled with pleasures from every source while experiencing no pain, neither in mind nor body, which is the chief evil of life. Um, I think this is really important. Everything Epicurus says is really important, but this especially, he mentions limiting your desires, which is to say that desire is a kind of pain. And once that desire is gotten rid of, once I desire candy and I get a piece of candy, that desire is taken care of. But I don't have to continue eating piece of candy after piece of candy. It's just unhealthy. Epicurus um, does a good job finding a middle way 
which can still be described as hedonism, but isn't as luxurious as other hedonists might live. Uh, what he's saying here is that um, if the things that these people who are not living with the maximum level of pleasure, if those things really did put an end to all of those problems, that would be fine. Because that's how they want to live their life. Um, they don't have to deal with the pain of mind or body. They found their own way. But it's apparently not the case. And we shouldn't take the example of people who don't live in accordance with the way that they should live. I mean, it's no one's place to say how someone should live their life, but Epicurus makes a good um, argument for his version of good life. Lawrence? Yeah. Um, what you said about limiting our desires and how desires are a form of pain, uh, there's another Epicurus quote. I don't think it's in the uh, principal doctrines, though. Um, it goes, do not spoil what you have by desiring what you have not. Because remember, everything that you have was once a desire. Um, I think that is, like, as Ruben said, this is definitely one of the more important points that Epicurus has made. Um, because when we do not have something, if we desire it, we feel pain without whatever it may be. Uh, when we obtain it, we get rid of the pain, and then that makes pleasure, but then we always desire more and more. That is just how humans work. But if we get rid of some of the desires, um, we can be happier people because we are not worrying about as many potential things. We are enjoying what we have. 